Hi, everybody. It uh, gives me a great pleasure uh, today to uh, welcome to the Cagney Room um, Robert Forster. Robert Forster has uh, made his Broadway debut in 1965 and his feature debut in 1967 in the John Huston directed Reflections in a Golden Eye with Marlon Brando and Elizabeth Taylor. He, since then, uh, he's gone on to star in over 125 television and film productions, including such notable films as Medium Cool, Alligator, and of course his Academy Award nominated performance as Max Cherry in Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown. <laughs> Please welcome uh, Robert Forster, the epitome of the working actor. Uh, it's great to be overrated. <laughs> <laughs> well, many thanks. I don't know. Nice. Yes, some of us would disagree with you. Obviously, you've you've just turned you've turned in some amazing performances over the years. I'm, uh, of course, very curious uh, how, how you got started. Uh, you you never intended to be an actor originally, right? You you got a degree in psychology, as I understand it. Uh, yeah, I studied history and psychology at the University of Rochester. I had started at a different school and went to a second school and finished at the University of Rochester. I studied uh, history and psychology and I was going to be a lawyer for no particular reason. Um, this, <laughs> now, this goes into the, uh, to the, the story of my, of the reason that I got into movies, wow, or the reason I got into theater. Uh, I was uh, pulling into a parking spot on the very first day of school in 19, whatever it was, 63 or 62. Now, is this at Rochester? It's or the University of Rochester. Rochester. I pulled into a parking spot, and before I even turned off the engine, in front of my car walked a beautiful brunette. I was struck by lightning. I jumped out of the car. I followed the girl. I was trying to think of something to say. Uh, she walked into the auditorium. They were doing an audition for Bar Bye Bye Birdie, which I had never seen. I'd never seen the movie, and I had never seen the the play, but I had seen the trailer to the movie and I knew it was about a guy with a gold suit who did a parody of Elvis Presley and I said, I think I'll uh, audition for the play, that's how I'll meet the girl. <laughs> and I did audition to, for the play, they didn't give me the part of the guy with the gold suit, they put me in the chorus and I thought, I don't want to do that, I wanted to play the guy with the gold suit and then I figured, maybe I should stick, I wanted to meet the girl. A Couple of years later I married the girl, we had three daughters, so it was, it was not a joke. And um, and, uh, and later on in the same uh, year, a guy comes up to me and he says, I'm directing a one-act Irish comedy. Would you like to play the, the, uh, the hero? And I thought, now you're talking. <laughs> and so I did. And by the time I finished doing that play, I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. I wanted to be an actor. I, uh, I went to my father who uh, had been an elephant trainer on the Ringling Circus in the years before World War II. And when I said, Dad, I don't think I want to be a lawyer, I want to be an actor, he didn't miss a beat. He said, I think you could do that, Bob. And so merrily, without knowing that there are this many of us and this many jobs, there's no mystery. <laughs> there's no mystery about why it is so hard. I uh, pursued uh, being an actor. I got uh, a job uh, that summer in a... Um, in the traveling or the uh, the summer stock theater, they had uh, uh, they brought in packages and uh, and they always had a few and, uh, and this is in part, Rochester. This is in Rochester, a little town right outside of Rochester. And then that winter, I got a um, I got a part in a community theater production of Come Blow Your Horn, and I got my first laugh in that production. Anybody who knows the play, uh, there's the part in the play with a showgirl. Uh, is standing behind the younger brother and says, would you like me to massage your think muscle? And I clammed up and made a face and I got a laugh. <laughs> and uh, from that point on, you know, I was not just hooked but landed. Uh, and thereafter, um, I, um, <laughs> weeks later, uh, a production of a thousand clowns came through Rochester, and I saw the production. I saw it in the in the matinee, 
and it was cold and I remember having a suit on because you know in those days you had to wear a suit to go to the theater. Um, and, uh, and so I was walking away from the theater having watched A Thousand Clowns, the matinee, it was cold, there was ice and snow, it's Rochester, New York, and I got to my car and I was thinking, geez, I'd like to talk to those people. Gee, they probably would be able to tell me some things. Because at that point, I was, I was dying to know how you do it and how you get into it. And as I got to my car and I had my hand on the, the, the handle, I can remember this moment clearly. And I said, what's the matter with you, Bob? Turn around and go talk to these guys. What the hell's the matter? If you don't do that, you have no right to say you want to do this. I turned around, I went back. I went backstage. I looked around. I introduced myself to somebody. Uh, who was kind enough to, uh, you know, take me seriously. I said, look, I, 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 I'm thinking about being an actor, and I'm not sure how, how to do it. And, what. and the person, I can't remember who it was, said, well, watch the show from the, from the wings tonight. You might like that. Uh, it was like, uh, you know, it was uh, like a miracle. Somebody brought me in. Or, and then uh, I saw the show uh, a, a second time from the wings, uh, and uh, what a thrill that was. Uh, and I got a couple of telephone numbers in New York City, and on a, and on a weekend, uh, some weeks or, or months, a couple of months later maybe, I went to New York, and uh, there was um, a group of actors from Northwestern, and they were generous. They had a Sunday um, scene class, which they themselves uh, uh, um, did the, the criticism, or the critique. And... Um, and I went there and I watched what they did and I saw what a class, what an acting class uh, or sort of uh, was like. Uh, my first introduction to that and, uh, and I met somebody who told me where I could get a, a rented room for uh, what turned out to be uh, variously eight dollars, nine, ten, twelve. I think I had a fifteen dollar a week room once but I started at eight and boy oh boy was that a rough deal but you know uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and so, um, I, I gathered little bits and pieces from here and there, and eventually I packed all my stuff, uh, the, the, all the stuff I could carry, um, and I went to New York City on the 17th of March, would that be uh, St. Patrick's Day? Yeah. Uh, of 1964, and I know it was St. Patrick's Day because I got off uh, the train at Grand Central, and didn't know that there was a shuttle to the west side and so I came up above ground and when I realized that I was going to have to pay another 10 cents to go back down there and get across I said I'll carry it and so I carried uh, my everything I could carry dragged it and I had to cross Fifth Avenue to get to the west side to go uptown and uh, and there was the, uh, the the parade so I'm certain of my uh, arrival date in New York City in 1964. And from that point on, and for a year, I uh, dodged around looking for some way to, to, uh, to, uh, to find a way in. Were you and taking classes? Did you continue I, no, I had to take penny. classes? I, I had enough money, and every once in a while, I'd have to f uh, go back on the bus, which was cheaper than the train. And, uh, and I was a substitute teacher prior to leaving Rochester, um, $26 a day. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it paid some bills and uh, got me back to New York. I'd come back for a few days or a week or so and go back to New York. And I did that uh, all through that year until uh, near the end of the year when I met a, uh, a woman whose name was Alice Conklin, I think. Alice, I'm certain of. And Alice um, had a class. She was in a class, and she said, would I do a scene with her for a class? And I said, sure. So we prepared uh, a scene from The Corn is Green. Anybody who remembers the play, uh, Ju uh, Betty Davis played the movie. And it was about a, uh, an older woman who was a teacher and a young guy who uh, was working in the mines and she thought he was uh, 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 better than to, to waste himself in the mines. So she asked him to, uh, to make, do better of himself. And, uh, and that was the, and we did a scene in which I can't quite remember, but I, was angry because, uh, well, because, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it was, you know, it was an interesting scene, and we did the scene for her class, and after the scene was over, uh, uh, she asked me whether I would do it for an agent. She had prepared uh, some agent to get to watch a scene of hers, and so uh, I went with her on the designated day uh, to an office, and uh, down, you know, I can't quite remember where it was in Midtown. And we did for an agent, several agents, a scene, that scene. And at the end of the scene, I 
collected the props and I went over in the corner and she talked with these agents. Uh, there might have been six of them or five of them. And one of them came over to me and he said, are you represented? And I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, I'd like to send you on an interview. I said, by all means. So I, <laughs> now look, I want you to know my first impressions were that this is easy. I, how easy this is. <laughs> Um, because when I get to the punchline of the story, you will think, oh man, this guy got lucky. And yes, I did. <laughs> and so, uh, all right, I'm giving you the long version. Anybody mind the long version? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, I, uh, I go to a, an office of a casting person. Her name was Terry Fay. I don't know whether anybody remembers that name, but uh, Terry Fay. Uh, and... Um, and I went into, uh, in New York, uh, off the hallway, you walk in, it was a little office with a secretary, and then an inner office with a bigger waiting room, and offices one after another off this inner waiting room. And so I walked in there, I told the secretary who I, uh, who I was there to see, and she said, go in and sit down. I was a few minutes before noon, that was my appointed uh, time, and I went in there and I sat down. And I see the clock, and I say, okay, it's noon, where is this woman? And, uh, and I wait a while, and now it's 12.05, and I'm thinking she probably forgot, where is this woman? And now it's 12.20, and I'm, uh, you know, and now it's a half past noon, and I'm annoyed. And uh, now it's a quarter of one, and I'm really annoyed. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, you know, what am I sitting here for? There's nobody in there. There's nobody but me, and nobody in any of these offices. Uh, it was either uh, empty or they were out to lunch or, or who knows what, but I'm sitting there all alone. And finally, around a quarter or a ten of one, the phone rings in one of the inner offices and somebody answers the phone, somebody I didn't realize was there. And, uh, and I hear this woman saying, oh, yes, we, got a, we found a great actor, a Canadian actor to play. And I hear her say, talking about the part that I'm there to, 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 uh, to Audition talk to her about. Reader, right? And... and uh, and I'm thinking, oh, man, she's talking and telling somebody they got a Canadian actor for this part. I said, that's enough. And I got up and I started to walk. And as I walked by a room, maybe she was resting or something all during that time that I was sitting out there waiting. I had no idea. All I know is there was somebody sitting at a desk that I hadn't noticed or didn't see when I walked in the first time talking. And she caught my eye and I caught hers. And she, uh, she, she realized and she, she said, uh, wait a minute. And she finished her conversation, she hung up, she said, uh, and I, she said uh, what's wrong? Uh, apparently she could see on my face, you know, and I had no idea what was at stake, you understand. So I told her what was wrong, and you know, you can't do that to somebody, I'm sitting out there waiting for you, da da da, -da. She said, well, wait, wait a minute, maybe I'll give you a reading after all. And I, being wise guy, said, you'd be doing yourself a favor. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and as I say, you know, when you don't know what's at stake, uh, you're, you're, you're not quite, uh, and so I, uh, she said, uh, and so she gave me a reading. Now, the play had been done prior by uh, Robert Drivis and Estelle Parsons. It was Mrs. Daly Has a Lover. It's a two-character play, a William Handley play. And I, um, I got the play. Um, and, I, uh, and they asked me to prepare between page like four and page eight. It was a 50-page play or so. It was a short play, one-act play. And I read the play, and then I prepared between page four and page eight. And so on the morning that I went to, to, the, to the theater, it was a Broadway house, and I uh, walked to the back. I walked in the stage door, and I thought, oh, man, you're in a Broadway theater, Bob. You came to New York to get in the theater, and here you are. Uh, and uh, you're actually in a Broadway theater in the back. And then uh, there was a stage manager, and I put my name on the list. There were two guys ahead of me, and eventually two guys behind me. I know they, sh they, they read five guys that day. And uh, as I walked on, I tiptoed, and there was somebody reading. And I walked behind the scenery, and I looked around, and I thought to myself, wow, what a crappy theater. <laughs> There were cobwebs, there was paint on the floor, there was, uh, you know, uh, dusty and so forth. And, I, and, and then I thought to myself, well, Bob, you know, that's probably what a real Broadway house looks like. Not the high school stages that I had been on up to then, and where you dare not put any paint on the floor or screw anything into the floor, you know. 
And I was looking around and then I heard my name and I walked around in front and I was introduced to Arlene Francis and to, uh, the, um, to the director, Joe Anthony, uh, Broadway, big Broadway guy at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and we sat down across from each other, a little short table, and started reading the play, uh, starting on page four. And when we got to page eight, nobody said stop, and so I kept going. And, uh, and I kept reading, and she kept reading, and now it's page 12, and now it's page 15, and now it's page 35, and gee, I, you know, I, I kept thinking, uh, uh, boy, I forgot about that. Okay, yeah, as the thing went by, and now we get to the part where She's been sewing buttons back on my shirt so my mother won't know that somebody tore my shirt. We're having sex, this older woman and me. Uh, Mrs. Daly has a lover. And, uh, and so she's sewing buttons back on my shirt and she pricks her finger and I say my line and she, and she looks at me and I look at her and she looks at me and I think, gee, I think it's her line. I, and then I thought, I looked at the top of the following page, and in parentheses, and I remembered what it said, grabs her finger and kisses it, and I dove for her finger and I kissed it. And I put it down, and we continued to the end of the play. And when they, we finished, uh, the guy asked me my name again, and I told him, and, uh, and I left the theater, and I had 30 cents. Uh, I had three dimes, and I uh, went to a phone uh, to call the agent who said, call me when you finish, and I threw a dime in the thing, and I lost the dime. New York City phones to eat them. <laughs> and I went to the next phone, which was right next to it, and I threw another dime in there and lost it. Now I got 10 cents left. I'm going to have to walk uptown for sure. It's a time when the, the subway was a dime. Uh, I, uh, and I figured, but I'm not going to blow this this 10 cents. I looked for a restaurant and there was Dinty Moore's. Uh, I don't think I ever ate there, but I know the name of it. And I, and I walked in and, I, uh, and the guy uh, gave me a funny look. Uh, and I said, look, I, I just did a, a reading and I've got to call the agent. And the guy softened up right away. Uh, maybe he was an actor or maybe he knew some actors, but he understood my plight. And I told him I only had a dime left and I lost the two dimes. He said, the phone around the corner right there by the men's room is, is fine. You won't lose it. So I went back there and I threw the dime and I called the agent. And the agent said, how'd it go? I said, gee, I think it went all right. I said, we read the whole play. He said, it must have gone pretty good because they just called up with an offer. <laughs> How easy. Oh, what an easy thing. This business is, you know, nothing. And so I got my first job that way. Some, we went out on the road for uh, eight weeks or so, and then we came back to a Broadway house, the, uh, the John Golden, I can't remember, 44th, 45th Street, right by 8th Avenue. And, uh, Any cobwebs in that one? I think there were plenty. Uh, but by then I was, uh, you know, used to them or something. <laughs> and somewhere during the Broadway run, Arlene Francis confided in me that the reason they hired me was because of the delightful way that I kissed her finger. So from that I remind myself and actors that there is uh, the, uh, the, the mistake or the, uh, the bungle or the... Uh, or, or, or a moment when it doesn't go exactly as you intended, but it was, it worked. So mistakes that work very often are, you know, a help to an actor, uh, something out of, uh, that wasn't supposed to happen that happened. And I also remind actors that it was probably the longest possible timing that could have worked, beat, 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 <laughs> grand finger, you know. And, uh, and so a mistake one gave me my first job. Uh, and now, now, you haven't, uh, up to this point, had a whole lot of formal training, right? Not much at all. Uh, and, and how much experience have you had on stage, really? I mean, at that point? Yeah, at that point. Well, I had the thing that I did, uh, uh, the chorus in... The, in, in Rochester. Yeah, right? and, bye -bye. and the, uh, the hero in the one-act Irish comedy where uh, I saw what a, uh, a Samuel French play looks like. I remember being in the... In the, uh, in the furnace room uh, of the playground. I was a playground supervisor during the, uh, you know, in the afternoons. 
Uh, that was the job I had. And, and there was a really nice woman who ran the playground. And, and so when the kids were gone between like six and seven or between five and seven or whatever it was, when the kids were mostly gone, I would duck in the back in the furnace room there and, and do my homework. And I remember sitting there reading that Samuel French version and thinking, God, if I only knew what an actor knows, I'd know how to say these words. I wonder how you're supposed to do that. And, and so I can remember clearly thinking, if I knew what an actor knew, I'd be able to do this. Uh, and so um, my very, very first important lesson on stage is this. I go to rehearsal for this play. And I've got the play, and, and, uh, and the first thing you do is you walk through the door, you jump over the couch, you kiss the girl, uh, you walk over to the table, there's somebody sitting there, something happens, and da-da-da-da, da-da-da. And this play was called The Devil Comes from Dublin, and uh, the devil was the tax collector. Uh, and I was Mike, the hero of this, of this piece, and I don't arrive until four or five minutes into the play. And so... Um, I, uh, I, uh, I try to learn the words and, uh, and figure out, and ah, this is how you do it, I figured. You don't have to know all the words. You don't have to memorize them. What you got to do is know that first thing you say is uh, da 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 and then you jump over the couch and you kiss the girl, and <laughs> then you come back over here to the table and you do something else. And, and I realized, ah, all you got to do is be. You know, it's not that hard. How hard is it? You just got to do that and say that and jump the thing. And on the first performance, I'm standing behind the, the set waiting for my entrance. And I'm standing there, and I can hear the audience. They're still coming in. Then you hear the audience quiet down. You know, the lights have come down. Then I heard the curtain open up. Then I heard the first couple of lines of dialogue on stage. And then I said to myself, OK, what's my first line? What's that first line? What do I say? I say, uh, I say, uh, oh, God. I walk in the door, and I say, uh, Oh, God, I, what do I say? And I ran around to the stage manager, and I said, what's my first line? And he tells me my first line. And as I walk back, I say, okay, now I say this, and then she says that, and then I say this, and then she says that, and then I say, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, what am I going to say then? Oh, I don't remember what I say then. Oh, geez, oh, no. By the time I got back to the door, I was shivering and shaking. I was wobbling. I could hardly breathe. I was heaving. And I recognized it as stage fright. I said, oh, Bob, you're stage fright. And this is what stage fright is. I completely lost what was going on on stage. I, I, um, I said to myself, and in a moment of clarity, I said to myself, if you go out there scared, trying to remember what the other guy is going to say and what you're going to say next, you can only be mediocre. You can't be really good. I wanted to be good. I knew I wanted to be good. I didn't want to be mediocre. Uh, and so I took a breath and I shook it off like you're shaking off a cape. And I heard my, my, uh, my cue. I opened the door. I jumped over the couch. I said my line. The girl said something back. I said something back. I walked to the table. I did the thing. The thing kept going. And I kept thinking, oh, God, I got away with it. <laughs> But the, but the lesson was, and I knew it from that point on, all you got to do is be. It is easier to be on stage than it is to remember. But what you got to do is you got to, you know, have, have uh, rehearsed it sufficient to know where you're going and what you're doing because the words will come to you, it's if, you if you relax. And, uh, and so it was a great lesson to me that you didn't have to be able to recite all the words of the play from a standing start. You've got to do it as the thing progresses, and you've got to understand what's going on and make each moment something that's real and believable and da-da-da-da. Well, you learn those things over time, and many, many lessons later, uh, you, you, you get a job, and you go show up, and you, and you do it. But you've got enough craft behind you, and I'm talking about now, uh, you've got enough craft to feel confident to walk out there and, and, and pretty much you know, deliver with the work that is required of an actor, which we can get into now or later as you choose. Well, I mean, uh, we're gonna. We, I, I, I mean, I am curious about this because obviously you've. It's, it sounds like, and I, I could be wrong. I know that later on, uh, in what you might uh, characterize as one of your fallow work periods, you, you took up uh, teaching acting and everything. So, uh, obviously, if you feel you can teach, you must uh, feel that you've learned something about it. So, I, 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 
this would be a, a perfect time to, to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how you discovered how you the craft. It. Yeah. My mother told me once, or more than once probably, Bob, you teach best what you need to learn most. And I knew that was true, and, I, and I, when I got to the point in my career when I couldn't get a job, and uh, when, you know, one year after another went by with real slim pickings, you know, holding your breath, my cousin asked me once, how do you survive, Bobby? And I said, honey, uh, with, uh, with um, um, what is that, when you get, uh, oh, God, when you... Kind of skinny your teeth? No, uh, when you've worked enough, they give you... Oh, unemployment? Unemployment, right. honey. <laughs> unemployment, <laughs> a few residuals, and the occasional job, and you sneak through, and, okay. and, uh, and that seemed to make sense to her. Um, but there was a moment at which, and I kind of trying to remember the year now, but uh, it was uh, in the early 90s when I said, maybe 90, 91, whatever it was, two, and I thought, uh, okay, this is the year you're going to have to do what you know, what I, years, years into it, when I said, if they uh, won't hire you anymore, you'll open up that little actor's workshop, and I did, and um, on a January, I had to Put in an ad in like in December and on a January uh, date a few actors assembled at a place that I had found and and uh, and it was real cheap uh, and and I always told actors to look for a place where they worked every single time because that's where you figure it out it's not that hard kids can do it but you got to do it and do it and do it in order to in order to figure it out and it should be very cheap because if it isn't cheap somebody will keep their hand in your pocket forever and keep you in any, and it doesn't mean there aren't great places to learn how to, to do what we do, but the most important thing I was sure of was to do it, and therefore um, I, uh, it was cheap. And so, uh, and after I did that for approximately a year, I had by then uh, told certain stories over and over. New actors come in and I would tell them the John Houston story, which is the the uh, advice given to me by John Houston the first time I uh, did a movie and I asked him, uh, uh, or he uh, told me he was going to give me some instructions. Uh, and, um, and, I, and other good stories, and the, a chilling Brando story, and a bunch of stories that I knew were good stories for actors and also had broader applications. And, and I had told these stories enough so I, at the end of about a year, a guy handed me a magazine, a guy I know, and, and it was speakers for free and I thought okay that's the next step I'll have the class and I'll become a speaker and I'll because I knew these stories had broader application and so uh, I put my name in the uh, in this in this magazine and the ad was not free by the way uh, it was expensive for me at the time and uh, and uh, and I got a call from a guy a sergeant of corrections in downtown Los Angeles uh, who asked would I speak to some white-collar criminals uh, at a halfway house, and I said sure, and so I put out a little, I put a little menu together. What you got a copy mm -hmm. of now? It's a different menu now, right. um, but I uh, put a, a little menu together, and I um, uh, drove down to um, uh, Midtown, uh, L.A., wearing almost exactly what I'm wearing now. I said, "What are you supposed to? What are you supposed to wear when you do this thing, Bob?" And so I picked this. And I said, okay, that's what you're supposed to wear. And, and I drove to this place in, uh, in, uh, in downtown L.A., and as I approached the building, I saw the building I was going to speak at, but I got cold feet as I approached the building and drove by. Ooh, what's, what was that all about, Bob? Were you scared? And I went around the block, and I said, okay, this time, you know, just go in there. And, and, and as I drove up again, I could not pull in, and I drove by it again. Oh, man, you're scared. What are you scared of, Bob? What are you going to tell these guys? And once I said to myself, what are you going to tell them? What makes you think you have any right to tell these guys anything of any kind? And, uh, and I said to myself, going around the second time, just tell them the truth. That's all it'll take. And when I said that, I realized that was all I needed. I pulled in. I went into the uh, to the room. All these guys were dressed in uh, white uh, jumpsuits. Uh, you know, they were halfway house, and I passed out my menu. It was shorter than the one I have now. It was about 15 items on there, and uh, somebody picked something. I started talking. The thing went like that. I knew that it was that I could get away with it, and so uh, I started speaking. And it is about 
the kind of things that, uh, well, some of the things that we're talking about now. Um, and well, uh, so, so guide me. Where, where, yeah, where right, shall well, I go with this? Well, thing? well, well. Speaking of that, uh, let, let, let's let's go back to the lucky period first yes. at the beginning. You've done Mrs. Daly has a lover. Yes. And how long how long did that run? It ran for not quite two months. We opened up in September of 1965 in the middle of the uh, newspaper strike of that year. We did not get any reviews, um, and uh, we had there was nowhere to advertise, and we limped along with a lot of other shows that year, and finally closed after about seven weeks. So we'd done it on the road for uh, some weeks, and we went on uh, in uh, into New York for that. So, so th th that's in '65, uh, and yep. then uh, you must have you you bounce into something else. I mean, at some point in about uh, what is is '67, you wind up in a stock production of A Streetcar Named Desire with Julie Harris playing the Stanley Kowalski role. Correct. And then shortly thereafter, yes, or you know, the same year, I guess, you're doing Reflections in a Golden Eye with Marlon Brando. Uh, now, I mean, I don't know when I'm when I'm looking at this, when I'm looking at the highlights and everything. I, I've got to think in, in listening to this. I mean, this is your gentleman who just sort of threw himself into this without sort of uh, uh, any uh, real. Uh, overwhelmingly nerve-wracking conception of what you were getting into. So what, what was it like for you going into your first film, a feature film debut, in a major picture directed by John Huston, with the man who made famous a role you had just come off of playing in stock? I mean, was there, was there any, I mean, did you come up and think to yourself, holy cow, and did he know that? Well, Julie Harris was in the movie with you. True, so, but see, the movie came first. Oh, the movie came first. I, that's how I worked with Julie Harris, and that's why I did uh, Streetcar thereafter. Oh, okay, the so it wasn't The movie was shot in 66. I leave New York after the picture, after the play closes. I go to Rochester, New York. I call up that girl, by the way, uh, that, that brunette with the black London fog raincoat and the high heels. Uh, I called her up. I said, June, you remember me? And she says, sure. I said, let's have coffee. Um, days later, uh, I proposed marriage, and uh, weeks later, we get <laughs> married. And uh, immediately thereafter, we drive to uh, Los Angeles. Um, so this is now um, spring of 66. I drive to Los Angeles. We take an apartment on uh, Fountain Avenue. Um, in those days, it took uh, several days to get the phone installed. Uh, the phone is installed. Uh, the first telephone call is from the agent. He said, you know who John Houston is? I say, no, I don't. <laughs> he says, well, he's a big guy in this business, and he wants to meet you for reflections in a golden eye. Great. I read it quick. I jumped on an airplane. I flew to New York City. It's a now, hot... He's in New York, and had he seen you in Mrs. Daly? Uh, he had not seen me in Mrs. Daly. I found out later, but, you know, he wants to meet me for reflections in a golden eye. That's all I know. I show up and I find this hotel on Madison Avenue. It's a Saturday afternoon. It's hot. It's bright. And as I walk into the lobby of the hotel and as my eyes are adjusting to the light, I realize there's everywhere, 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 there's guys. They all look like me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he wanted to meet me for Reflections in a Golden Eye. This is a cattle call. Get out of here. I took a hike. I walked around uh, Midtown for a couple of hours, and I thought, oh, man, you came all the way. Don't you think you better walk back in there and meet this guy, Bob? And so I talked myself back to the hotel, and I walked in again. There were less guys. They put my name at the bottom of the list. There is always a list, as you know. And I waited, and eventually somebody called my name. They escorted me up the elevator. We waited outside of a room. Somebody left. I'm escorted in. I'm introduced to this tall old guy. What have you done? <laughs> what have you done? I said, look, I haven't done much. I did one Broadway play. I wasn't bad, but I don't make myself an actor. I never did a movie. I don't, I'm, I don't know what the tricks are. Uh, I, uh, uh, but if you hire me, I'll give you your money's worth. He says, Ray, Ray Stark, a big producer, come in here, Ray, I'd like you to meet an actor. 
And I'm thinking, I, uh, you know, I didn't want to oversell myself. Uh, I didn't want, who is this guy, I thought. <laughs> Event, in comes a little guy, I shake hands with him. I turn back to the big guy. He says, uh, you'll be hearing from us. I figure that's the kiss off. When somebody says, you'll be hearing from us, you never hear from anybody. <laughs> I went back to the airport and I stopped in Rochester on my way back here to say hello to my father. I get off the plane two hours after, my father, after this, this uh, meeting. And my father says, quick, call your agents. They're working on a deal. And as I say, the first two jobs I had, I thought, how easy. <laughs> I fly back here to Los Angeles. A few days later, the agents arrange a telephone call between me and John Houston. I'm on the phone with Houston. I say, now look, I, I, uh, I uh, thank you very much for hiring me, and I appreciate it very much. I said, but do you remember I told you I never did a movie? He says, I remember. I said, well, um, um, and reading my mind, he says, I'll give you some instruction. Great. About a month later, I meet him over at uh, Western Costume, over, used to be by uh, Paramount, no longer there. I go straight to Houston, and I, uh, and I say, now look, they sent me the script, and I read the script, and you said you had some instructions for me. What are they? And he says... But not yet, Bobby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe he's going to take me to lunch. Maybe he's going to bring me on a set. Uh, but, you know, I'll wait. And uh, he's the boss. And I wait. And days go by. And nobody calls. And days turn into weeks. And nobody calls. And weeks turn into months. And nobody calls. And you haven't started the movie yet. Oh, no. Right we haven't started the movie. Uh, and, and during which time Montgomery Cliff dies and has to be replaced by Marlon Brando. And this does take some time. Finally, I get the call. We're going to meet on Long Island uh, for 10 days of shooting. Then we're going to go to Rome, Italy for 12 weeks. Wow. I show up three days early on Long Island, an old military base, um, Mitchell Field. I go straight to Houston and I say, look, all summer long I've been reading the script. And you said you had some instructions for me. What are they? And he says... But not yet, Bobby. <laughs> and okay, what's he waiting for, I wonder? Now it's the night before we're going to shoot. Everybody in the cast and crew, we're all having a dinner at a long table. Not Elizabeth Taylor, not Marlon Brando, but everybody else. And I'm sitting where you are, and John Houston's sitting where I am. And all during dinner, I assume he's going to lean over and toss me these pearls of wisdom. <laughs> no such thing. At the end of dinner, I lean over to him and I say, now look. Tomorrow morning, we're going to start this thing. Don't you think now's the time to give me these instructions? He says, tomorrow morning, Bobby. Tomorrow morning finally comes. They put me in makeup. They put me in a car, uh, in, in wardrobe. They stick me in a car. They drive me to the set. The car comes to a stop. I get the back door open and one foot out. And from behind, I hear Houston say, now's the time, Bobby. <laughs> Shoot, I said, I'm all ears. He says, go take a look through the lens. And I walk over to the camera, and the cameraman steps aside, and I look through the lens, and I turn back to Houston, and he says, you see those? Those are the frame lines. I looked again, I said, you mean the, the line that shows the cameraman what the audience sees? He says, those are the frame lines. Now ask yourself this, what needs to be there? <laughs> He did not take me by the hand and tell me everything that had to be done. He expected me to have, or to, and all of you who are actors know the process, he expected me to do the detective work to figure out why I was in the scene and why the scene was constructed the way it was and why uh, what I had to say was in the scene and what, I was, what that scene added to the movie. He expected me to do the detective work so that when I heard action, I could deliver what was intended by the writer and the meanings and intentions the writer had for me, I would understand what they were and deliver them. Also, he didn't tell me, but eventually he told me in each shot, and everybody here understands how movies are shot, in each shot you're expected to do something the director needs of you, maybe an entrance or an exit or move the furniture around or who knows what. Uh, but whatever it is the director needs, um, you've got to deliver that when you hear action. But that's not the end of it, I realized eventually. The one who set the lights wants you to be in them. And the one listening for the words got to hear them correctly because at the end of the shot, 
if they don't, uh, if the words aren't there for the sound guy, somebody says, no good for sound, start again. Or if I do something too big for the shot I'm in, somebody behind the lens says, no good for composition, start again. Or if I put the cup in the wrong spot, somebody says, no good for continuity, start again. The actor owes something to just about everybody on that set. Everybody is your boss. Everybody needs something from you and you cannot get from action to cut, print, and move on to the next shot until you've delivered a stroke which advantages the needs of everybody on that set practically, as well as the other actor who may have to do this emotionally in a scene and for whom you've got to build a little ramp, Bob, so that this guy can do this emotionally in a scene. You, you owe something to the other actor, as well as to the guy who was cutting this thing. You've got to be able to First of all, you have to understand how the roller coaster of this movie is constructed. We want the audience to get into a roller coaster car with us and have fun and have a, a, an adventure and a few thrills and go around those curves. And you've got to understand how it's constructed so that you can add to the downs and the ups and the going around the curves. And you've got to make it believable because if it isn't believable, going around those curves, the audience will fly out. If they don't believe what's going on, they won't be with us at the end of the ride. And so you owe something to your audience and also to the editor who's cutting things together. And for the one who hired you, Bob, you got to help bring this thing in on time. you got to be ready when you hear action so that you can make this thing in one or two or three takes as soon as possible so they can move on to the next shot. And for yourself, you want it to fall as simple as physics requires. No more, no less. Real, authentic, believable, honest behavior and honest actions. Stuff that you, when you see them, you're not appalled at uh, what you're watching. Um, uh, honest, believable stuff, I always imagined, was, uh, was important. And so, um, I remind actors, well, I, I remind most audiences that I talk to in that little, that little program I do are not actors. And so I remind them of this. There are actors I know, even though this sounds like a big deal to do all those things at once and, and, uh, and finish up and the guy says, cut, print, move on to the next shot. Sounds like a big deal, but I know actors including myself, who I would not trust with a grocery list, who can do it eight days a week. It is not that hard to create an action which advantages everybody on that set. We do it every time we go to work, actors. And I use that as a central metaphor for this little program by which I remind people that if they keep other people's interests and needs in mind, likely they can accomplish not only what they need, but what other people need as well. It is not that hard to create an action that advantages more than just yourself, others as well. And, uh, and so, I uh, am... Well, this, th I can see this, can, this insight and knowledge can be accumulated over like, you know, a four-decade four career. But True. when he, when you looked through that camera the first time, yes. and was that it? I mean, that was the extent of that what was he had the, to tell yes, you? But, but so, it was relatively simple stuff. I had practically nothing to say in that movie, luckily for me. Uh, I, did a lot, I had behavior. And, uh, you know, that seemed like something I could uh, d deal with and accomplish. So without a lot of training, but with on-the-job training, which is no doubt, uh, uh, you know, real strong and valuable, uh, and I remember thinking to myself, Bob, if you can't make these people believe that you know what you're doing, you're not going to last long. So do it with, uh, with uh, you know, the kind of uh, confidence that uh, uh, somebody who knows what they're doing has. And if you can't accomplish that, you're no actor. Well, you, you certainly, I mean, it's an, it's an amazing film. I just actually watched it recently, and I'm struck by a, a couple of things. Uh, one, by, uh, by how confident you appear in the role, obviously. I mean, uh, it's true you don't have many words to say, but um, unlike uh, a lot of uh, flashier roles, maybe, uh, there's a tremendous sense of subtext with you all the time, and and yet and, and you arrived at that without any kind of. I mean, how did you do that for the first time? I mean, you, you weren't getting, you didn't get a whole lot of help from. Uh... Well, occasionally, no. He he was. Uh, he'd say, "Look, Bobby, uh, I want you to enter the shot, or or we're going to open on you, and you're sitting there, and you're just thinking, and you're, you know, he described things, uh, what he wanted to see in that shot, uh, or." Uh, Oh, he said, uh, "Okay, let's see. Let's see what you got to do. Oh, you got any ideas for this? Uh, you know, and, and it wasn't that hard. It didn't seem it didn't seem impossibly hard to come up with something that 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 approached believable behavior. And you know, I was playing a guy my age uh, uh, who was a soldier, and it was uh, didn't seem that far from 
what I ought to be able to, uh, you know, deliver. Um, and you and, make certain assumptions, obviously, when you start. Like, for instance, your character, Lieutenant, uh, I forget what his name was now, but he, he's, in, he's in love with uh, Marlon Brando's wife, right? I mean, is that... Yes, I'm a private, and, private. I'm, uh, and I'm just, as you, that little scene that you showed uh, was uh, when he gives me instructions for how he wants his, uh, his, uh, his uh, landscaping to be. And, of course, when he comes back, I've chopped the thing, I've chopped it, and he goes nuts. He's mad at uh, and and, uh, and goes crazy about. Uh, gee, he didn't. Anyway, he. But it isn't until he sees me riding around the uh, the, the woods like Nature Boy, uh, and uh, and and so. On that day, I see the wife, and sometime after that, he sees me riding around in the woods, and uh, that's where he starts being attracted to me, and I've been attracted to his wife. Um, um, yeah, well, that's the basic for a story. While, yeah, that's the basic. I mean, because it's interesting because you say, like, for instance, when he gave you the instruction to uh, to clear that little what we saw. there, what we saw, what, what, what actually we just saw. Um, I mean, it almost seems uh, intentional when he comes back to find that you've cleared the... Did, do you make a decision like that ahead of time? I mean, in other words, like, it's... It, it, I mean, that's what I'm talking about in terms of subtext. In terms of the character, there, there always seemed to exist, uh, uh, maybe it was just the confidence that you, maybe it was just your, your, the, the, the fact that you were suddenly, I mean, how did it feel? You, you were acting with Elizabeth Taylor and Marlon Brando. I mean, apart from the fact that, you know, this was your first film, I mean, was that in, ever intimidating for you at any time? Or were you just, damn, never going to let anybody see that? And I didn't know what was at stake. I was um, unaware of how big this was. I figured if anybody had anything to worry about, it ought to be them, because, you know, <laughs> they, they, could, they could only worry that I didn't, you know, that I wasn't going to deliver. I wasn't worried that they weren't going to deliver. So, you know, I had confidence in everybody. And then I, uh, you know, the only ones that, that, that they might be worried about would be me. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and, and that subtext, you know, remarkable how many times doing very little but thinking about the real events delivers whatever it needs to, and the camera does the rest. Uh, you know, uh, and, and don't forget, you're, you, you're with a master filmmaker who right. knows how and, and where that subtext uh, ought, to, ought to be put in. And, and now, do you find that there's a, a, a difference between... And granted, certainly at this point, so you'll have to, you can talk about your, from the perspective of your entire career, but at this point, you know, you've done some stage, and now you're doing your first film and everything. Over the course of time, I mean, do you find that there's a difference in technique between the stage and the film, or do you approach both similarly? Uh, well, there's a... There's a big difference between anything big enough for the theater is too big for the movies. Um, even in this room, this is a small room, so you know I could speak in normal tones and and you could hear them even without. Uh, are we are we are we amplified here? I, I think we are a little bit yeah, in the room. But, yeah. Okay, well, uh, but even without amplification, this is a room small enough almost to do real tones, but you get much bigger than this, and I'd been in much bigger places than this. Well, you know what it requires. It requires reaching the last row, and if you uh, don't do that, uh, you know, somebody back there will want their dough. Uh, so, you know, you, you got to belt it, or whatever it is you have to do. That's very, very different from believable uh, uh, movie behavior, and or and small behavior, and, 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 and so... Um, Anything big enough for the theater is probably too big for the movies. Um, and so on, on that basis alone, they're, they're different. But um, do I approach them the same way? Boy, every single time, and for many years, I said to myself, boy, now, how do you do this again? Each time I approached it, I'd have to rethink, how do you do this? And how do you be good at this? And how do you, and what does it take? And every time I, uh, each script seemed to require something different, I realized that it isn't always the same. Uh, um, different material requires different things. I once read 
a TV Guide article. It could have been in the early 80s, but it, would, it, it was um, a conversation between some casting directors, and this article was written after that conversation. And the thing that I, reason I tore it out, I probably still have it in a, in a file somewhere, I remember what it said. It didn't cover everything, but it covered a lot. It said this. It said that this business buys three things. It buys great beauty, and by that uh, they also include sex appeal, great personality, and you know, there are some actors you just like to watch. They're fun to watch, uh, and great talent. And by talent, they went on to describe these three things. The ability of the actor to understand what the material requires of him. And by that, I said, gee, that sounds right to me, because every time I did it, it required something different. I would have to figure out something new about who I was and, and, who, and what the material needed. And so to understand what that's about, I guess they put that in the category of talent. Additionally, it said, talent also includes the ability of the actor to bring the material to life using himself, not somebody else, not trying to be somebody else, but bringing the material to life using who you are, and the ability of the actor to make it exciting for an audience to watch. Now that was, uh, I didn't quite understand that, but I decided, for myself at least, that for the same reason documentary was compelling and riveting, because you believed what was going on. When you see documentaries, you, you believe that, well, if, if they're the kind of documentaries like the old ones, uh, where you you buy what's going on. You think you've seen a, you see you, you think you're looking through a window into some life or some experience that you aren't ordinarily privy to, and you believe it. And I said to myself, if I can make my work as believable as that, it ought to be watchable. And so that's the theory. And you know, you always work with theory. You, you work with with ideas. I mean, if I've talked to 275 actors on the subject of acting, and I have. I've heard at least 275 different stories about what it is they do. And I'm always, uh, you know, interested uh, and, 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 and amazed sometimes when I watch actors work and think, I wonder how he does that. Uh, because, you know, you never know how somebody else is doing it, what they're working. But I work with certain ideas, and one of the ideas I work with is it ought to be believable. It ought to have some ring of truth. I remember a really good story, a John Huston story, that a guy told me once. Um, about the movie, The Man Who Would Be King, and probably most of us saw that movie, there is a scene when the three principal guys, uh, um, it's Sean uh, Michael Connery, Michael Caine, and, and, uh, and the guy playing uh, Kipling, uh, were in an office, mm -hmm. and uh, John Huston, and they were shooting the scene, and, and at a certain point, John Huston cut the, uh, the scene, and walked over to Michael Caine and said, you can speak faster, Michael. He's an honest man. And I said, wow, the ring of truth. And you, if you're, if you're speaking truthfully, it just comes out. It, you don't have to ponder those words, and you don't have to you know, labor them. All you got to do is say it. And so that made me understand that there is a ring of truth, and that that ring of truth is important. And John Houston pointed it out to Michael Caine. You can speak faster, Michael. He's an honest man of the character that Michael right. was playing. And so the ring of truth uh, uh, is, is important, I say to myself. And if I can make my stuff believable in, 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 in uh, you know, technique, you know, technique is, uh, is one of the things uh, I say to myself, OK, uh, on that little menu you got, I got, uh, I got a bunch of stuff I remind actors of, two golden rules. I remind them there ought to be only one, I'm sure. But there are two golden rules in my uh, thinking about things. One of them is. It takes place during the, 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 the rehearsal process, the process when you're, when you're discovering, uh, when you're trying to figure out what the meaning is that the writer intended. And if you understand the meaning of what you're saying, then all you got to do is mean it when you say it. Know what you mean and mean it when you say it. Not that hard. You can always check whether the performance was any good afterwards by listening to it in your mind and asking yourself, did I mean it? And if I didn't mean it, if I get another shot at it, let's try it again. And, and, and if I can mean it more, uh, OK, so a golden rule. Know what you mean and mean it when you say it, Bob. And the second golden rule I give myself is know those words so well that you can say them the way thoughts come out of your mouth, not the way lines come out of your mouth. But if you're saying something that you believe and mean, you ought to be able to say it. You're not searching for the words. You've got to understand those words. You've got to drill yourself, especially long speeches, 
But even short speeches, uh, you've got to walk on that set on the first day of production or any subsequent day of production and do material as well as you are prepared when you've done a play for six weeks. That, the words come to you. Anybody who's done a play for a long time, the words are there. You don't have to think about them. It's not like the first performance. It's not so. Movies, on the other hand, you've got to walk out there with no preparation. Uh, sometimes you don't even know the other actor. Sometimes you walk on a set the, the first day and you meet the actor and da-da-da-da, hello, how are you, da-da-da-da, and now you're intimate or, or whatever. And you've got to know those words, Bob, is uh, so solidly that when you walk on that set, you can uh, say them the way thoughts come out, not the way lines sometimes are, are fashioned. So I take it then uh, with film, like you say, where, where you don't have a lot of uh, preparation time on the set anyway, and often don't even get a whole lot of rehearsal prior, you know, with the other actors sometimes prior to actually shooting a scene. Does that mean then uh, in your preparation process uh, with a script that you spend uh, time, a great deal of time obviously learning your lines? Uh, uh, sure, sure. I mean, do you have a... Uh, a method of doing that? Do you do you bout, read them with somebody else, or do you uh, just read them with yourself? Well, or, well, or, no, I don't. I don't depend on reading them with anybody because a lot of times there's nobody to read them with. You're at some place in some location. You're in a hotel room and you're trying to learn tomorrow's work. And but what I do do is um, I take the scene, and uh, chances are by the time I, uh, I, I I get to the day before shooting, I've read it sometimes. I, I know what's in that scene. I have a feel for what the scene is going to be simply because, you know, little by little by little, the preparation work that starts when you, when you read the script for the first time and does not end until the last shot, the last take of the last shot. You're still learning and gathering things, uh, hopefully. Uh, that, that never stops. But um, I, I, I take the scene. And I, uh, and I take a napkin or something and I put it over my stuff and I read the other guy's uh, cue and I try to remember what that line was and I say it, uh, even if I'm not certain that I'm saying the words right. And then I look at it to see how close I got. And eventually, and part of that process is to improvise the words. So that even if I don't know what the speech is or the line is, I say what I think it is. I, and I say it the way I might say it if I, if I were saying it from myself. And then I go back and look. And, and so I start by trying to understand what the meaning of the scene is. And if there is, there's almost always uh, set up stuff and pay off stuff. I mean, it's like telling a joke. You've got to set it up and pay it off with the punchline. Well, very often scenes are written in such a way that you're setting something up for somebody else or setting something up for yourself later on or, or, or there are things that are connected to an earlier scene that you've got to make sure you understand is there so that somebody else who set it up in a scene, you know, 20 minutes ago in the picture, you're paying it off here or, or there's a key moment. You've got to understand what those things are so that when you get to it, uh, if the director doesn't, uh, doesn't have to tell you, 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 part of the discovery period of process is finding out all of those little connective things that, that, that theatrical material is composed of. It's not made of helter-skelter stuff. It's like poetry. It's, it's refined down to the stuff that is the audience needs to have to carry this story along and, and, and to have us enjoy it. And so it's, I think of it like, um, you know, um, uh, a screen door key, you know, that little latch that has a hook on it and you hook it to the, through the, the hole. Well, some of them are short and some of them are long, but those are the things that hold the movie together and they're set up here and you pay them off, they're connected to that. And Maybe that's not a good metaphor, but the idea is there are lots of things that need to be set up and if you're responsible for that, you've got to know it and do it. And if you're responsible for the payoffs, you've got to know it and do it. And uh, so, so theatrical material is, is composed of that kind of stuff. And, and as you discover it, uh, and sometimes you don't discover it until you're on the set. And then, oh man, if I'd known that before, oh, okay. So you're learning stuff every shot, every take, and until the last take of the last shot, you're still trying to pull that material together and make stuff work that, uh, that you hope is, is important for, uh, for, the, for the movie. Um, and so, I improvise every line. I, uh, I, I got to be able to say it for myself, not just the line. I'm not, I can't just remember the, the words. You got to know what the intention of that word so that you know what you mean. And then when you hit that set, hopefully 
when you hear action and what comes out of your mouth, your hope is as close to what the guy wrote or the girl wrote as you can because you're, you, you recognize that, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's flow and delicacy and, and poetry sometimes in the words and you want to give the writer the best of it. But I do not try to remember the words exact. I try to remember the exact intention and hopefully get to where the, the writer wrote it. And, and hopefully, and if I make a very small adjustment, hope that it isn't something that somebody, that jumps out at somebody, hope that it's something that somebody says, ah, oh, yeah, I believe that. Oh, you know, and, and when I hear cut, print, move on, I know I, or I hope I've done uh, the, the proper job for not only the, the director, but for the writer who's not there ordinarily and who gets short shrift in a lot of situations with actors. So I take it, uh, I mean, generally, I'm certainly now, anyway, are you nervous when you approach a new role at all? Uh, ordinarily not. Uh, ordinarily at this point, by the time I read the thing and, uh, and maybe read it a couple of times and have accepted the job, when I accept the job or tell my agent, yes, I'd like to do that if, uh, you know, if, if, if they want me, um, by then I, I know that I can deliver. Uh, I may not know every single thing about that script that I'm going to know, later on, but I know that I can find in me something that I know is going to be credible and that, uh, and that will feel believable to me. Um, although, you know, in the days when, when, I got, when I was doing lousy jobs, I had a five-year first act and a 25 or six or seven year descending second act. Every time I thought I hit the bottom, I was wrong. There was another bottom and a, another <laughs> bottom. And, and uh, you know, uh, you think you uh, you can tolerate this level of of a job, but uh, then it falls. And and when I was doing lousier lousier jobs and uh, worse paying and and less, I and with four kids, um, I took any almost almost any job offered to me and figured, you know what, I can do something with that. So at this point, I'm not nervous about it. I figure I can do something with whatever it is they. Somebody decided already that they're willing to uh, to to offer me, and uh, and so uh, um, uh, it, it, the the nervousness does not uh, no at this point I'm um, it's been long but it took me at least ten years before I would say out loud that I was an actor I knew from that from the first few experiences that I got away with it by the skin of my teeth and. Uh, and uh, at least 10 years went by before I decided that uh, I was an actor or that I could say it. And it took me much longer than that to, to decide that I was reasonably good at it or, or you know, m adequate at it. Because it's it, not... It, uh, it, it's funny, I mean, because, you know, every, every actor, every, every human being obviously has a public persona and then the private persona. So and I hear you saying... You know, it, it took you 10 years before you sort of privately felt that you had some sort of real command of your craft. But uh, in, in uh, reading up about you and everything and uh, uh, reading what's been written about you, uh, the tone of some of it, like c certainly in that five-year uh, first act, that five-year ascending first act, they make it sound like uh, you've done this film with Marlon Brando, and then you retired to Rochester to uh, sort of wait for the offers to come in. I had no, I had no money. I went back to Rochester and uh, worked as an iron worker for uh, six months, and then I did uh, the, uh, the 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 um, uh, well, play back. with. Yeah. Oh, the, oh street, then you did the play. Then I did the play car. with uh, Streetcar, and then I went back to work as an iron worker, and then I got another job and went away, and then I didn't have to take jobs in between anymore. But it was a couple of years I did uh, uh, substitute teaching, and then I worked as uh, an iron worker for a couple of stretches of uh, some months each in whatever year that was, 67, uh, approaching 68. 68 January, I uh, got a, my second movie with... Um, Gregory Peck, uh, Stalking, Stalking Moon. Moon. And uh, from that point on, I, I make a living as an actor. Um, but prior to that, I, you know, I had, I had a wife and, uh, and duties and, and no money. So when you're back in Rochester originally there and you're in between these first couple of films, uh, are you reconsidering? Or are you just... Uh... No, I just, you know, I just, I had to have a job and then uh, I could get one at, in, in Rochester. And uh, I remember working with a guy, John Clemente. 
Uh, he was uh, a, a real character. If uh, if he, you know, if, if he was an actor, he'd be a great actor because he was a great character. I never laughed more than working on this job with this guy. He smoked a cigar, and he was my partner. On as a, as an iron worker, we worked up high, and uh, and it was raining on a particular day. On the day that Reflections in a Golden Eye opened, noon. It, the first show was at noon, and we were having lunch, and it was raining, and it was raining, and he didn't want to go out. Uh, we were under the shelter, and it was raining all around us, and he said, oh, man, I don't want to go out of work. And, uh, and I said, you know, uh, if you want to go to a movie, <laughs> right around the corner, and so John Clemente and I went to the Regent Theater, which was a block and a half from where we were working in downtown Rochester. And uh, we, you know, dressed the way we were with our hard hats and our stuff, and we went in there and we watched the 2 o'clock show. And when we got out of that movie, uh, he, this guy said, what the hell are you doing here? You kind of... <laughs> And he said, what are you doing? No clothes on. Jesus Christ. You know? <laughs> and from that point on, you know, back in work the following morning, I got a lot of ribbing. And, uh, and uh, you know, that job lasted for a couple more months. And then I got the job uh, with, um, with Gregory Peck and uh, said, see you later, boys, and, uh, and went. The uh, but on the day that I that the picture opened in Rochester, I saw it with, my, uh, with the guy I was working with, John Clemente. <laughs> We, 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 should, we should move on chronologically, but, but you, did, you mentioned something that I just thought I just can't uh, uh, leave alone. The, uh, uh, the film, is, I, I think, is, is a good film and one you, you, can be, you can be proud of. I know that uh, you seem unlike a lot of uh, you know, actors, uh, very sort of uh, uh, distant from your own work. In other words, I, in print anyway, you know, you, you don't have any problem like talking about a film. Oh, that was a, you know, uh, something like this. But anyway, anyway, this one is a is a good film, and uh, for those people who've never had a chance to see it, uh, one of the notorious moments in it, uh, Bob is riding horseback, bareback, naked, buck naked in the in the film. Now, two things uh, struck me. I mean, that, 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 wasn't, that, wasn't completely, <laughs> that wasn't completely uncommon for you, I've, I've found, in your early films in the 70s and everything. It seems like it was a period, uh, surprise, even though we talk about today, like, you know, how much more progressive we are filmically, you look back at the films of the 70s, and, and nudity certainly was just tremendously casual. I mean, you went on to do... Um, Medium Cool with uh, Haskell Wexler, which is a great film. We can talk about that in just a minute. But the one just little acting question I have to ask, Rochester is not known as horse country. Had you ever ridden a horse before you did that film? Because <coughs> well, you're supposed to be a horse expert kind of in that movie. You know, um, I had ridden a horse, of course, uh, for 10 cents around the ring. My, my mother... <laughs> brought me to the horse thing and I sat on the horse. I, I had never been on a horse other than that. But when asked, could I ride a horse, I did what actors are supposed to do. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, sure. And, uh, and so, um, I read the script prior to getting to the set and I read the part where it said, rides naked on the horse. And I thought to myself, gee, I wonder how they do that. Probably trick photography. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and so, when we got to Italy, John Houston arranged for me to go to a, a place where they had horses and ride around a little bit. So on successive days, I started with a horse with a saddle and a, and a blanket and a bridle. Uh, and uh, then on the second day, they took away the saddle, and here I was with the blanket and the bridle. And then on the third day, they took away the blanket and the girth, and here I was bareback on the horse with the thing. And then the next morning was the morning that they were going to shoot the bareback, bare-ass riding on the horse. So did you, appro did you approach your rehearsals as a sort of a method actor? I mean, were you... Buck naked during the rehearsals? Or? Oh no! I'm kidding. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I listen. I I could. I never imagined for a second. I still didn't know how they were going to do this. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, 
early in the morning in Italy when we arrived on the set. And it, before I even got out of the car, I saw a guy riding around naked. Jesus, that guy's naked on the horse, riding around. The camera was setting up and, and, and you know, following the guy with the horse. And he was riding the circle that I was. And, I, and, I, and immediately my vanity or something took over. And I said, uh, I went to Houston. I said, look, you know, I can do that. He said, can you, Bobby? I said, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and the next thing I know, the wardrobe department hands me, you know, the cup from a jock strap, you know, a little mesh thing, and a roll of tape. Uh, it, it was dyed, flesh-colored, and a roll of flesh-colored tape, and they handed this to me, the women giggling, and that was supposed to be for my modesty. And so I did my best to attach this thing, and it was, uh, and jumped on the horse. And you know, within a couple of riding that horse, it was it was um, sweaty and lathered, and and, I, and the next thing you know, this thing went to the wayside. And so, <laughs> and I said to myself, and I remember thinking, now look, Bob, if you cannot do this, you're never, never, never going to be able to succeed. If you cannot just uh, do it as if you have absolutely no fear, then then if you do it halfway you're bound to fail at it. So either, either accept that, that this is a, what you, no more modesty, because uh, you have none at this point, uh, and, uh, and uh, let's go. Uh, so that was, that was the John Houston picture. Then in the, the what's it, in medium, the, cool. medium Cool, we are uh, Haskell Wexler, big, important uh, cinematographer, making his first film. It's a kind of an uh, um, interesting film because if the script was this long, uh, we didn't just shoot this much, we shot that much. There was a lot of stuff that was improvised and stuff that on the spur of the moment, uh, he said uh, one day uh, we did an improvisation uh, and I told the girl that I was a CYO boxer and uh, the next day or a few days later, we, sh we uh, shoot at a, uh, a gym. And uh, we do the little, uh, the, 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 the hitting the bag Some scene the bag with stuff, the kid, yeah. and uh, part of which was uh, improvised. So there was a lot of things in that movie that gave me far more than I could have imagined. I didn't know that the actor didn't get words every time, that the actor had to think up some words once in a while, and that you had to bring a frame of reference to the, uh, to the job, and, and you had to work from that, and you had to be believable, and all those things that I was just, you know, toying with. But, and so he says to me, he said, I want the girl to be naked in this scene. I said, yeah. And he says, why don't you ask her? I said, why should I ask her? He said, well, you're doing the scene with her. That's OK, you know. And uh, she says to him, she says, well, I'll be naked if you will, him. I'm not part of this at all. You know, I'm still, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and so she says, if you're naked, he says, well, I will if he will. So it, it got to be, you know, ridiculous at a point. And, and I said, all right, look, let's go. Uh, so we let the, uh, the, the pigeon free, and the pigeon starts flying around the set. And it was only um, Haskell and uh, Marianna Hill and me. In the, in the set. Everybody else was gone. And Haskell and, uh, and so we just run around and trip and play and, uh, and, and as I say, I decided from the uh, from reflections in a, in a golden eye that if you had any fear or trepidation it was going to show and so you had to do it without fear and with no, uh, no compunctions, Bob, or else don't do it. Or else uh, fail. Or else uh, you shouldn't be here. And, and, and so I uh, talked my way into uh, you know, let's go, Bob, but I can promise you this, uh, I, uh, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> All right. We've, we've, talk, we've talked about the, the, uh, the, the early, early career. Um, at what point, I mean, this is, uh, I, at what point did you get the sense, and how did you know? I mean, because the quote, uh, I had a five-year ascending first act and a 25-year descending uh, second act is your own. Uh, at what point did you know that you were in a second act? I mean, what happened? You, you were, your first film was with Marlon Brando and Elizabeth Taylor. Then Medium Cool, you worked with Gregory Peck. I mean, really, over the course of your whole career, you've worked with just about everybody. I mean, you've had an amazing career, but yet you characterize a second act as being kind of like 
descending? I mean, what happened and, and how did you know? I mean, when well, were you I, aware? I did a show called Banyan, 72, 1972. It was a nice show, episode. old cars, old clothes, old jokes. <laughs> What's that, old? <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, that show got canceled. It did not, uh, the, the, the producer, writer, the creator of the show died in our, while we were shooting our first, oh. um, our first order. Uh, we had we, were, we had a 15 order, and we were in the 13th episode. And I get a call from his wife. Uh, Ed died this morning, and uh, and of course, uh, you know, it was a big. Uh, uh, the guy was a good guy. This guy liked me. He trusted me. He encouraged me. He said, uh, he said, you know, why? Uh, he said, you got uh, your own patois there, for story. He said, I said, oh, you know, go ahead and use it. And, uh, <laughs> and, and this guy liked me, and, and uh, what a good guy, and um, he, he died. And the show did not continue. That wasn't the only reason. It was an expensive show, and, and I don't know if we were on the borderline, and there was nobody. So when that show died, uh, I didn't know exactly at that point, but a year or two later, when the second series I tried, which was called uh, Nakia, Nakia, good guy, Indian, deputy sheriff, New Mexico, contemporary, and dull. Cops and robbers in the desert. This was actually and would have been a better series if it had been called Billy Jack, the television show, because it was Billy Jack, the television show, but no one bothered to buy it from Tom Laughlin. So after the pilot was shown and the order, we had already had an order for 13 after the pilot, the pilot was shown, and on the following day, Columbia was sued by Tom Laughlin, rightly, for never having bought the rights. And that's exactly what it was. It was Billy Jack. And so we knew that that 13 was as many as we were going to shoot. And so we shot the 13, and we knew the show was going to be over after that. And so the second series died. That's when I know that things were not as good as they were prior, because uh, I, 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 that was the date from which, in my in retrospect, you know the things started going in the in the wrong direction. And then you know, job after job, uh, they weren't as good as uh, Reflections in a Golden Eye or Medium Cool or or what have you. And uh, and you know, little by little, the slippage you could feel it. And every time you got a job, it wasn't maybe as good a job as as, as the last. And and then the the money was less. And then the da 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 da. And then no no Winnebago. And then no uh, you know, no clean socks. And uh, so they got worse and worse until I was bringing my own wardrobe. And uh, by then you know it has long peaked. But, but when the second show started, it didn't, didn't, um, uh, wasn't successful. Uh, you know, I had I was certain things were not uh, progressing in the proper direction. Which you weren't, you, you can't, you couldn't have been necessarily uh, as cognizant. Ne cogniz cognizantly aware of it as you are now, retrospectively, because I mean, True obviously that, that second show was canceled through. N I mean, you couldn't have taken personal responsibility for that, or anything. yeah. But you know, in this business, uh, you get responsibility for any failures. Uh, somebody's got to, you know, let's blame somebody else. And, uh, and no, I knew that. That I knew those were not good signs, and I knew uh, at that point we were going downhill. And I said to myself, "All right, Bob." Uh, keep your skills good. Uh, give it, uh, give it the best you got. Because uh, if somebody hires you once, uh, you're going to want them to hire you a second time. So deliver the goods as you, as best you can. And you know, I learned a lot of lessons in that that uh, that down slope period. Uh, that's a long period, 25 years of of uh, realizing you had a really good shot, but uh, you're not there now, and uh, you're looking for that next shot. And I remember thinking. Uh, uh, when I had time on my hands, I went to uh, UCLA and I studied physics uh, one, one year. I went to Valley College and I studied uh, oh, uh, Italian and, uh, and earth science and uh, economics. And, uh, and I figured that if I ever got another shot, I'd want to be a little bit better at what it, I'd want to deliver a better me. Uh, and uh, and uh, no, I never gave up. I had a, an epiphany moment. In about 1990 or 1991, I, uh, yes, because I had stopped running in 89. I ran the marathon, the LA Marathon in 89 and finished and uh, haven't run since. I uh, wore out one knee 
uh, it had been injured and, and, it, and, and so I don't run anymore. But after that I picked up a tennis racket and I went to a park on uh, Fountain, uh, Plummer Park. And I would hit the ball and get my exercise, you know, I knew I had to keep on getting exercise. And, and there was an old guy that I would hit with once in a while, Joe Stein. He was a psychiatrist who had written several books and still had patients and he was 79. This guy was an old guy, but he was not only good with a racket, he could put the ball anywhere on the court he wanted to. All I had to do was get it back to him. So he couldn't run very much, but he would play with me. And, and as I was walking into the park one day asking myself, how am I going to survive? How am I going to get the kids through college? How am I going to save the house? How am I going to, uh, what am I going to do as a career if this thing dies on me? What am I going to do? And as I was walking into the park, I saw Joe over there, he was hitting the ball gently against the wall, waiting for me, and I stopped in my tracks and I said, geez, that's the answer. Don't quit. Joe is your example. This guy never quits. He's still got patience. He's still writing books. He's still playing tennis. He can beat me. He's pretty good at it. Uh, this guy never quits. Joe Stein. And I said, that's the answer, Bob. Never quit. You can win it in the late innings if you don't quit. If you quit, you got to learn something else. You got to get good at something else. I was just getting good at this. And I figured, don't give up acting. Uh, there's nothing that you've ever done that's been more interesting or, or uh, pleasurable. And, uh, and if you quit, you got to get good at something else. And then I said to myself, yeah, Bob, but how do you get from the hole you're in to winning it in the late innings? And it came to me instantly. I said, well, you deliver excellence to what you're doing right now. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen. And if you deliver excellence to right now, you will get the best shot at the best future you got coming. And in addition, I also knew at the moment that if you deliver excellence to whatever you're doing right now, you get that reward. They tell you you're going to get the reward of self-respect and respect from others and satisfaction. This is the real McCoy. If you deliver excellence to what you're doing right now, when I say excellence, I'm not talking about perfection. Perfection is a sure loser. Excellence is merely giving it the best you got. If I'm going to do this job as good as I can think up to do it and actually do it that way, that will give you the reward that I just mentioned. Reward of self-respect, respect from others, and satisfaction. That's step two. Step three is never quit. You can win it in the late innings. Ah, yes, Bob, but what about that good attitude? Yes, you've got to have a good attitude because if you haven't got a bad attitude, you can't deliver excellence. Excellence is precluded to you if you have bad attitude, if you're holding on to negative stuff, if you're mad about the fact that you're not getting any the good jobs anymore. So I said to myself right then and there, and it took much less time to happen than, it's, than it is to explain it, but I realized... <laughs> Instantly, you got to have a good attitude. So, accept all things. That thing they write books about. There's shelves of books about acceptance. It's one of the religious things. Acceptance. And I realize if you are holding on to being mad because you're not getting the good jobs anymore, Bob, but if you accept it, whew, your shoulders relax and suddenly you can concentrate on and deliver your best to right now. The only moment you can create in is right now. And so, accept all things, Bob, that gives you a good attitude. That's step one. Step two, accept all, it, deliver excellence right now. That gives you the best shot at the best future you got coming. And step three, never quit. It's not over till it's over, but then it's really over. So, <laughs> <laughs> never quit, you can win it in the late innings. And I promise that three-step program, you've heard of a 12-step program, this is easier to remember. <laughs> Accept all things, that gives you good attitude, deliver excellence right now, that gives you the best shot at the best future you've got coming, and never quit. You can win it in the late innings, Bob. And, uh, and that is the way I promise. I, have, I approached everything from that moment on. It was a big moment in my life, and I said to myself, whatever jobs you get, you're going to deliver the best you can and, and accept what, it, what if it's a lousy job. If they're not giving you the, uh, the Winnebago anymore, Bob, put it behind you. She doesn't love you anymore, Bob, put it behind you. Acceptance gives you a good attitude and lets you deliver excellence right now, being the only moment you can create anything in. Well, your career certainly demonstrates. I mean, you may feel as though you've... you've you crystallized all that and coalesced all that in 1990 or thereabouts, but your career obviously indicates otherwise because I guess even, even earlier, I mean, 
everything that I, I, I researched, you know, uh, for this uh, interview, and uh, I watched a lot of your movies that I hadn't seen. And I apologize. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 it's been an absolute uh, pleasure because I, I have to say, you always deliver excellence. You're, you're always eminently watchable. <laughs> I mean, in that, in that uh, early downslope that you were talking about, uh, you made an interesting film, I mean, uh, with uh, Rock Hudson called Avalanche. You played a photographer in that. It's just, uh, I mean, you, you were one of the best things in the picture. It is one of those hokey uh, well, it's, uh, it's disaster movies disaster or whatever. Disaster movies, yes. But, uh, Roger Corman disaster movie. Oh, it's a Roger, Cor it's a Roger Corman Pretty sure film. Roger Corman... Uh, Made that movie, and so your middle period is characterized by some of those cult films. I mean, the next year, I guess, or maybe even the same year, you made what many people consider to be a cult classic, Alligator. We showed a, a clip great from movie, that. Alligator. See, there's a lot of movies in. There's a lot of movies in the middle that oh, I loved them, and I loved Alligator. I mean, there's a lot of pictures uh, that that I had a great time doing um, that that I used to think of as. Um, comic book movies uh, or cartoon movies, you know, not dramas, uh, you know, where believable people are doing dramatic things, but movies that are structured to give an audience a ride and have some fun, and, and Alligator was like that. Alligator was a spoof of Jaws, and, and, and you know, it was, a, it was a roller coaster ride and fun. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, 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 absolutely. This is your show, so no, I mean, no, no, you can do it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's great. In fact, it, it was interesting to me. I just watched it recently. They've just now reissued it on DVD, so yep. it's, it's out again. So hopefully some residuals will come in for that. Oh, I don't know. those residuals get you thinner know, and thinner, yeah. as you well know. Yeah. And when I started, they weren't residuals. So uh, in the first few years, there weren't residuals. And then uh, they came in along as I, my career was heading south. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know. So you got, but the interesting thing that, that I, I thought about that in the film when I, when I was watching it uh, uh, was that uh, it's one of the few uh, horror movies I'm no big, uh, or I guess, monster movie. John Sayles characterizes it as a monster movie, not a horror movie. But I, I thought it was uh, interesting in that he sacrifices the kids. And, I mean, children die in that movie. The alligator eats children, which, you know, you, you, don't, you don't see that often in, in monster movies. They stay away from the children, you know. Well, they sacrifice those bad teenagers all the time. But, yeah. but kids, you know, they, I, thought, I thought that was interesting. But um, anyway, uh, the, this, this seems like a good opportunity to get into one of your subjects on your, uh, on your speaker's list. But uh, to get there, let me just say that... Uh, I've noticed that you seem to be, maybe it was your psychology degree, your history of psychology degree, you seem to do quite a bit of talking to yourself over the years. And you, you, you seem to be- I'm an only child. But that's, but, but that's a good thing. <laughs> but the, and, 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 and that's a wonderful thing. You, you also seem to have been like your best coach. So I mean, I, I think it's interesting and I certainly think the actors in the audiences would be interested about the, your ideas about an agent, and finding an agent and needing an agent. I mean, because uh, you, did you always have an agent in this 25-year downslope, or were you on I, your own? I or? almost always had an agent. Uh, I went through an awful lot of agents. The first 12 or 13 years, I had one agent, and he stopped being an agent. Uh, he became a producer and uh, handed me off to a, another guy who was my agent for 13 years. So for the first 25 years or so, I had the same I had continuity, but when the second agent really, my career by then was slipping and slipping and slipping, and, and I figured, all right, uh, I, I better uh, take a shot at another agent. So I called a, uh, an agent, a guy I knew, and I said, uh, um, David, uh, you think you'd like to handle me? And he said, sure, come on in, we'll have a conversation. We did, and he handled me for a year and got me a little work, and, and, uh, but couldn't uh, get me much work, and then eventually uh, I had a long, dry period, and I figured, all right, I better try somebody else. So. After the first 25 years, I had one agent after another and went through an awful lot of agents. Now, this is the one thing I know about agents. Um, you cannot find an agent. An agent's got to find you. Um, any agent I ever asked to represent me, you know, did a passable job, I suppose, but uh, couldn't really uh, carry the, the ball for very long or, or, or for any distance. And... And, uh, and any, a lot of a agents will say, yes, I'll take you and I'll represent you, but you don't have an agent until somebody comes to you and says, 
I think I can do something with you. And sometimes they'll say that, but don't really mean it. But when you find somebody who does mean it and who knows or thinks that you can, you know, well, make money, because that's basically all they're really, really looking for is somebody who can, they can, they can uh, uh, put to work and, uh, and have, uh, uh, do their job and no nonsense and come back and be in the stable until they can find, find something else for you. And so I remind actors and myself that uh, you got to keep putting yourself out there and putting yourself out there and putting yourself out there and never quit putting yourself out there. And when you find an opportunity to deliver the goods, you step up and deliver the goods. And uh, no nonsense. And you cannot be afraid of it. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're, you know, uh, you're holding back. But if somebody comes along and says, I want to represent you, which happened, well, by the time Jackie Brown came along, I had no agent. I had no manager. I'd been working for two or three years with, you know, uh, Fred Williamson, who does crappy movies and, uh, you know, uh, the dopiest stuff. And anybody would offer me a job, and uh, I'd say, yes, let's go. And because, uh, as I say, I had kids, and I was trying to save the house. Um, and so there was a point right at the end when... I had done a low, low budget picture with a guy named Paul Chart, British guy, who came along with the first good part I'd had in a dozen years. And this was a little picture called uh, American Perfect. Yeah. It is one of, it is a great picture. It is, it, it is. It is a great picture. And this guy made it for nothing. And I had done it. Um, and. And I had no agent. It's uh, Amanda Plummer and David Plummer. Dulles. You play, David a, Dulles, that's you play right. a, 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 a killer. I, I, I got stuck actors. in bad guy parts yeah. from 1985 when I went to, uh, to Israel and shot uh, um, Delta Force. Uh, the first time I played a bad guy. Up until that point in my career, I'd only played good guys and, and liked it. And when I had to play a bad guy, I didn't want to do it. And the agent said, uh, you know, listen, this is what I got and they're willing to pay and you better go. And I did. I finally went and I did the job and I hated it playing a bad guy, but, uh, but uh, you know, got away with it uh, and got stuck in bad guys for 13 years. And the last bad guy I played was in uh, uh, American, Perfect. American Perfect. And um, and a lawyer had something to do with the picture. I have, don't remember what, but he saw the picture and called me up out of the blue and said, uh, you know, I saw uh, American Perfect, and uh, I think you can still carry a picture. I said, yes, I can. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, then, uh, would you like to come into the office and uh, let's talk about it? And that's when I knew I had some, I, I cannot tell you the feeling that uh, you get when you know somebody really believes in you. And that's when you got an agent. And until you get that agent, you can't stop putting yourself out there and putting yourself out there and never quit putting yourself out there because sooner or later somebody may say, I like that one. I think that one can work. I think I'll do something about it. And then you got an agent. Um, but, uh, but I asked many, many, many agents to represent me, and many did, but for only a short length of time and with very minimal results uh, during that, you know, the 15-year of that 25 year, you know, for the 10 or 12 years or so, you know, uh, you ask somebody to do it and they say yes, but uh, that's not an agent. Only when they give you the feeling and go out and do it, uh, you know, represent you and get you work and believe in you. I will be remiss if we don't uh, wind up, you know, talking about Jackie Brown. Um, but before we get there, uh, and I don't, don't know how much more time we have uh, really, but uh, I did, you just reminded me that I did want to ask you about, I mean, in addition to being an actor, you also, in this uh, trough that you were going through, uh, decided to produce a picture yourself called Hollywood Harry. Ah. Can you talk about that experience a little bit, what it was like to actually, um, you know, sort of take your career into your own hands? And I mean, ultimately, would you recommend that for people or what, I mean, what do you think? What Not for the mean? faint of heart uh, to, <laughs> to make a picture. Um, I had worked on a picture called Vigilante, a, an exploitation uh, picture made in New York City. They ran out of money. 
Um, and I uh, went to a guy I knew and I said, look, these guys are three quarters of the way through the picture. They need so much money. Uh, you think we can find it for them? And uh, this guy went out and found uh, uh, maybe it was 140,000 or 125,000. It was some number like that. And, uh, and so I went on the hook. That was in the middle of the long drop. That was in, uh, you know, what year was it? About 1980, 81. And, uh, and I went on the hook for this amount of money. And when we now, finished, now, why did you go on the hook for it? Because I was a star of the movie, and, and if they um, didn't finish the movie, uh, you know, how was I going to, you know, I figured this is my shot here. I'm going to get this movie made, and we're going to, you know, I'm going to succeed in it. Uh, you know, you think, you're, you're, you think what you got in hand is going to do it, or you're yeah. hoping it is, and you, and you, you got to put, pull out the stops and deliver everything you got to what you're doing in hopes that that'll carry you to but the But you next weren't step. responsible for paying back the money, though. I mean, oh, of so course I was well, responsible were. for it. Okay. They were responsible to me, but ultimately I was the one who was on the hook for the dough. So they finished the picture. We went to uh, Cannes, uh, and, um, and as a side story, uh, we had a, a very old film salesman, Irv Shapiro, the oldest foreign film salesman working at the time. Irv Shapiro had sold silent movies. He had sold, <laughs> he had sold silent movies. And so this guy had been with it for a very long time, and in 1981 or so, he was a very old guy. He's not with us anymore, but Irv Shapiro uh, and, and, and Bill Lustig and I and Andy Garoni, the producers, and, and I went to dinner with some German distributors who we hoped were going to buy the movie and get us out so that I could get that, that, that 140 grand off my back. The clock was ticking. It was now 144 or whatever it was, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so we went to dinner with the German distributors, and after dinner I went to Irv and I said, Irv, you think we'll make a deal with these guys? And Irv said to me, Robert, he said, it won't be a deal when I make it, and it won't be a deal when we reduce it to writing, and it won't be a deal when the lawyers finish with it, and it won't be a deal when we get the check. Only when the money is spent and can no longer be returned will a deal <laughs> be a deal. That's great advice. And then he said, and there's only 400 ways to break the ironclad deal. That's when I knew I was in way over my head. And so eventually they paid back Oh, 90 some thousand, almost $100,000. I was on the hook for the remainder. And I paid that 25 or 40 or 35 or whatever that number was, I paid that off over the next five years during very high interest uh, period of, uh, and so I had to pay all of that dough off myself. And this is for vigilante. This is for vigilante. Now, 20 years or so later, I'm having, you know, the guys who produced it, young guys, uh, who, uh, who got robbed. I don't know whether anybody remembers the name of uh, Ed Monturo. Ed Monturo was a notorious guy here. He was an exhibitor, and he disappeared with our picture and, and, and other things, never to be heard from again. Uh, there are those who think that uh, somebody offed Ed Monturo because he's never been heard from again. Anyway, he ran with, uh, with our money, which the picture made money. The picture, could I could have gotten paid off. 20 years later, I'm having dinner or something, or, or I can't quite remember. Maybe, they, maybe the guy, the producer of the picture, wanted to add some, a track, a, a commentary track to the DVD release. Right. And I said to him, Bill, I said, you remember you guys still never paid me back that uh, the thing. He said, how much was it, Bob? Now he had money. And in the two days later, he handed me a check for whatever it is that I... Uh, so, I, I, what a story. This guy, in 20 years, I never heard a bit about it, but the minute I asked him, he paid me. Uh, and uh, so, we, uh, we, we give these guys high grades, uh, Bill Lustig. Um, and, uh, and so, I, while I was in Cannes, saw how they sell movies. What the wise guys do is they create a one sheet of a movie that is not yet produced, and they put stars' names that they hope to get, and they put it up in a booth, and they collect uh, uh, commitments from foreign uh, distributors uh, who will pay so much for this picture in a year when it's, when it's finished. 
and you take those and you bring them back to a bank and discount them, they give you money, you go make the movie, you bring back the picture, and you satisfy. I didn't know that's how they did it. I said, how hard could that be? <laughs> so, <laughs> I came back to LA and I contacted a writer I knew and I said, hey listen, I want to work on a little movie and I want it to be, and I called up my daughter Kate, who had, when she was in the, when she was six, had called me up while I was doing Streetcar. Uh, second time I did Streetcar was at Lincoln Center with uh, the 25th anniversary with, uh, um, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, and, okay. and so uh, I was doing Streetcar and I get a call from my daughter Kate when she was six and said in a gravelly little, hoarse little voice, she said, Daddy, me and Lizzie want to audition for Annie. I said, really honey, have you been singing a lot? She says, yeah, we got the record. And so, uh, I said, uh, learn how to sing so you don't kill your voice, and I'll come and watch what you do in school, and uh, if I think you're talented, I'll try to encourage you. But I didn't want to send her on a fool's errand. I wasn't sure I wasn't on a fool's errand of my own. So <laughs> when she was 12, this happened. I went to Cannes, and I went back, and I called her up. I said, Kate, you still want to work? Uh, she said, yes, I do. And I had gone to see her little projects in grammar school, and... and and, uh, and I knew that she was serious about it, and I knew she was in. I said, so I said, are you ready to work? And she said, yes, I am. And so I went to the writer, and I had him create a little story about a detective. Uh, it was called The Littlest Detective at one point, but now it's, then it was eventually called Hollywood Harriet, about a broken down detective who lives in Hollywood who doesn't want to fall in love anymore, and who's 12-year-old, but by the time we made the picture, 14-year-old niece. <laughs> comes and uh, shows up at his door one night and says, my parents are dead and I'm living with you now. And, uh, and, I, and I can't get rid of her and uh, she's clever and eventually she saves me from the bad guys. It's a comic, uh, it's a spoof of detective movies. Uh, I still had the Banyan stri pinstripe suit and I figured, okay, I got one costume and I, and I could still fit it. And so, um, <laughs> and so we made this little movie uh, about uh, the, the little detective movie. And, um, and uh, what, how did I make it? Ah, oh, stories about that movie. I had classic things happen to me. I, uh, I tried for a couple of years to find somebody to make it with me. Or f I was looking for half a million dollars. I figured, arbitrary number, I could make a picture for half a million dollars. It was a SAG picture, by the way. Um, and, um, and eventually, I made a deal with some guys who had made some money with Alligator and liked me. And I had met in Cannes. I had gone there the f subsequent year trying to sell this idea for Hollywood Harry. And these guys said yes, they would uh, work with me. And so they came into Los Angeles, and we had they stayed at the big hotel in the middle of Beverly Hills. And we negotiated for four or five days. We made a deal. They went back to uh, to England and Ireland, where they had theaters. These were exhibitors, and uh, they were going to put up three two thirds of the money, and I was going to put up one third. I was going to sell the only thing I had that was a uh, was an investment. And, uh, and, uh, and I wasn't going to touch, but now I realize if I was ever going to get that house in Malibu, it was going to be with this, so I better sell the thing I had. And so I sold my, my property in Rochester, and, uh, and I had, uh, had $150,000 that I got from it. And I called up these guys in, in, uh, in London or, or in, in Ireland or wherever they were. I couldn't get them on the phone. Oh, jeepers, what am I going to do now? I couldn't get them on the phone. Finally, these guys bail out without even a sorry, without nothing. I sold my property. I got my 150000 And I said, OK, Bob, let's make the picture with what you got. And so I made the picture with that, and I borrowed 20000 from a, um, a girlfriend, uh, the girl in the picture uh, that I danced with. And, uh, and another, and my cousin uh, loaned me another 10 grand. And with that money, I made, I got the picture to rough cut. And then, uh, I, uh, and then uh, somebody introduced me to a, an accountant who introduced me to a, a banker. And uh, the banker decided to trust me for another 100 grand or so to finish the picture. Uh, I went on the hook for that. We finished the picture. I went to Cannes with it. We sold a few territories, not many, but, uh, but enough to start with. And I knew it was going to be a slow process of getting this money back, but I felt sure we were going to do it. I felt sure we were going to get that, that, uh, that uh, uh, house in Malibu. And, um, and 
That was the year, 85, that I went to Israel to shoot uh, Delta Force. And while I was working on the set, Menachem Golan, everybody remembers his name, said to me, whatever happened to that little movie you were trying to sell in Cannes, which I had, you know, it was just months before. And I said, well, we sold such and such territories, but uh, the rest of the world is uh, still available. He says, I will buy the rest of the world. Wow. wow. <laughs> Now, what he, what he offered me for it was more than I had in. But by the time we got to, by the time we signed the deal on Christmas Eve of the year, that year, I guess, they had, I learned what grinding the deal means. Anybody doesn't know what that means? You start at a number and they find reasons to take away some and take away some more and take away some more until they gave me exactly what I had in the movie. $325,000 is exactly what I had in the movie, not a penny more. Uh, and, uh, and so I sold the movie uh, for, for $325,000. I paid everybody off. I saved enough out of that to not get the house in Malibu, but a condominium in West Hollywood, and I was delighted. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And, and the worst thing about it was when I went into the office on the 24th of uh, December and signed the deal, the guy gave me an advance of $25,000. I was broke beyond words, had nothing for Christmas. I went out immediately after that and did Christmas stuff. Uh, and, you know, uh, and when I was in the office, not Golan, but the other one, not, not, uh, Globus, said to me, by the way, we're changing the name of the picture. I was struck like with lightning, uh, the other kind of lightning, the kind that hurts. And I said, uh, but, but, but the, the Hollywood Harry, it's a great title. It's a, it's a comedy title. It, it says everything about it. And, and, my, and by the way, my, my credits are, were animated. I had animated credits. It was a fun little movie. And the credits had been animated. I got a kid from uh, Caltech or wherever they do that and, and, and signed a deal with him. And he gave me uh, you know, a set of credits. And he said, no, but we're going to change the title of the movie. I said, but, but why? He said, well, we need to. I said, what are you going to change it to? He said, Harry's Machine. <laughs> <laughs> but why? I was almost in tears. He said, because we want to change the name of it. Later, I found out that the reason they purchased the movie to begin with was because they had sold a package of movies one of the titles was Harry's Machine, and they hadn't made it. <laughs> <laughs> so Hollywood Harry became Harry's Machine in that package, and, uh, but they didn't fool around with my titles, and, and the animated titles uh, remain. It's, a, it's not much, but it's not junk, and I promise I had a great time, the most stimulating time of my life, making that movie, learning things you didn't expect to learn, understanding filmmaking in a way that I had never figured out before, uh, and, uh, and made every single step by myself. Uh, I figured I didn't know enough. I didn't know what the end step was going to be, but I knew that at this level I could do this. And then when it got time to carry all the sound and, and, and picture reels around, they, they packed them into my trunk and I brought them from one sound editor to uh, this different kind of editor. It was, uh, it was a long process with lots and lots and lots of information and always knowing this. Experience yields information. You can't learn less. You must learn more. That's Buckminster Fuller's remark. But true enough, and I knew it then, and, uh, and it was a great experience making my own picture. Um, and, uh, and it sold, uh, in, in video, sold uh, 23,000 copies, the first issue, and that's a million dollars wholesale. So those guys made plenty of money. They gave me my three and a quarter. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, nonetheless uh, delighted. So you don't own the you don't own the picture anymore. I own you basically nothing. Sold no, I own nothing of that picture. All right. Eventually, I got it on television. Uh, went on uh, Showtime for a year. I don't know how many times they played it, but they owned it for one year. Showtime, and that was a big accomplishment at that point. Yeah, you know, it sounds sounds like it. Congra congratulations. Let's yeah. um, let's uh, get to uh, Jackie Brown. Now we might as well. We'll. Uh, I mean, there are so many more really great pictures. Everybody who who may not know, pe films like Twenty Ninth Street, Twenty Ninth Street, Diamond, 
Diamond, Diamond Man came later. Ter 29th Street ter was before Jackie Brown. Everything Diamond is dated Man from was after Jackie that, Brown. But uh, the terrific picture. We don't have time probably to, to talk about all those. Uh, let's talk about the, the film that uh, turned your career around, I guess yep. you would say again. You I bet. Mean, because the, uh, the, the way that came about is a fascinating story in and of itself. I mean, uh, Quentin Tarantino was a huge fan of yours from movies like Vigilante and... Uh, some of the other pictures, or early alligator, some of the early pictures that he had seen of your stalking moon, I think he had seen and, and always admired your work. Um, and uh, the sort of little restaurant stories about how this uh, happens, I, th I find are fascinating. I mean, you were just, you were eating, eating a meal in a, in a local restaurant here. I was in, uh, when Schwab's closed in 1983, you know, you gotta find a place to have coffee in the morning and read your paper. And uh, when Schwab's closed, uh, all the actors and all the hangers on and all the writers and directors and uh, hookers and you know whoever went to Schwab's remembers the joint, uh, they went to the Four Winds. And uh, I found a place on uh, very close uh, on Santa Monica, one west of, uh, of Crescent Heights, and still there. And it had been there for many years, an all-night uh, agri uh, and was called uh, Theodore's, now it's called the Silver Spoon. And I set up there uh, in uh, about 84, uh, and I have been there since. So I was, uh, have my regular spot, and I was sitting there one day, and uh, in walks uh, Quentin Tarantino. And as he walks in, I yell at him, and, and he comes over. And, uh, he now, says, you, you'd already known him, obviously, because you were I read for, for him some, once. You'd read for him uh, I read for, him for, for um, Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs, right. And, uh, and I thought I did a nice job, but... Uh, but I didn't get the part. Uh, anyway, he was walking to the restaurant. I call him over. He sits down. I, we blah, blah for a while. I ask him what he's doing. He says he uh, is adapting a, an Elmore Leonard novel called Rum Punch. He said, why don't you read it? And I did. And um, six months later, I walked in to the restaurant. It was, it was uh, spring, and it was damp, and the, 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 the drapes were down. It was, and, uh, and as I walked into the, to the patio and made my right toward my seat, over there in my spot, sitting in my seat, is Quentin. <laughs> and as I approach, he lifts up a script, and before I even get there, he hands me this script. And I take the script, and he says, read this, see if you like it. And we talk for a while more, and I go home, and I read the script. Now, my story is exactly like Pam Greer's. I read it. And I thought, what part does he have in there for me? <laughs> I was not used to getting the big parts. I was looking for something small, but I said, but you know, the only part that really, really looks like me is the lead guy. Could he have meant that? And when I called him up, uh, I said, yeah, I read the script. It's, it's great. Uh, and uh, and uh, all right, so let's meet at the Silver Spoon. So we meet at the Silver Spoon, and I... And, and uh, you know, with, with a heavy heart, I say to him, because I knew it was true, they won't let you hire me. I'm, I, I got nothing going for me at this point. I said, uh, I don't think they're going to let you hire me. And he says, I hire who I want. And I thought, man, if he's right, look at that, Bob. And out of nowhere, with no agent, no nothing, comes... Quentin Tarantino and this great job. Now, it took uh, two or three weeks before I actually got a call from that lawyer. Remember I said a lawyer had called me up? Days before this event, the lawyer had called up. I had sat in his office and I had no prospects at that point, but I called up the lawyer and I said, I just had a meeting with Quentin Tarantino. He says, I certainly know who he is. I said, and I think he's got a job for me. And he said, well, we'll know he has a job for you when I get a call. And, because I told him who the lawyer was. And so, um, on a uh, Saturday, I went over to Quentin's house prior to getting the job, and, and I uh, read the script with him. He read all the other parts. I read the Max Cherry part. And we talked, and he screened an old Banyan. I had a, a, a 16, millimeter print, so, 16 millimeter print of Banyan. And he screened it, and we watched it, and kidded around, and talked, and then we reread the script, and I read the Robert De Niro part, and he read the other parts. And when we finished doing that, I said to him, "Look, I said, I understand the part of the 
Max Cherry. I don't understand the other guy's part. So if you're saving a really good thing for me, and it's not going to be Max Cherry, don't let it be this other guy. Because you know, say, if you're going to save me something and, and mean it, then make it something else. Because I only understand the Max Cherry part. And as we walked out, and he walked me to my car, and he put his arm around my shoulder, he says, don't worry, you're going to play Max Cherry. And at that point, I assumed he was uh, not kidding. And a day or two later, I got a call from the lawyer who said, yep, they called, and yep, they, they offered you the job. So it was uh, really, really out of left field, and uh, with no ass kissing, no begging, no <laughs> chasing, no none of the stuff that... You know, it's always, always, almost always part of the gig-getting process. Um, this thing walked in, and uh, you know, I was uh, absolutely flat at the time. And uh, this guy gave me a job and a gift, uh, the size of which cannot be exaggerated. I mean, because obviously you haven't stopped working since. Well, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, we could hear more, but I think it's probably a good time to wrap up. So I want to thank you very much for being a part of this. It's been a uh, thrill. I thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. All right.